give them a key. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Conwingo Baptist Church, and uh, welcome here on this beautiful snowy morning. Uh, it was supposed to be forecast to snow right, basically, but we were starting. This is perfect. Um, this morning we are uh, blessed to begin this service with the ordinance of baptism. And baptism, what we believe here, baptism does not save anybody, um, at least this water. Uh, the water where we go down and come out does not actually uh, wash away any sins or anything like that. Um, what it is, is it is an act of obedience. It is a, a physical picture of a spiritual truth. And that spiritual truth is that the moment that a person uh, repents of their sins, turns to the Lord Jesus Christ and says, I am a sinner, I need to be saved. And they turn to Jesus and they say, I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe that three days later you resurrected from the grave. And because you resurrected and took my sin and my shame onto yourself, because you did that for me, I am forgiven and I am healed. And so anybody who believes that that's what Jesus did and that's who Jesus is, Anybody who believes that, the moment that they confess with their mouth, believe in their heart, the Bible says they are saved, and the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of them. So not only does all their sin go away, all their sin is forgiven, but at that exact moment, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell and to live inside of that person. They are baptized by the Holy Spirit, by God Himself. So what we do is we go under the water. Because Romans 6 tells us that just as Jesus died and took our sin on Himself, our sin has been buried as well. You and I, we identify that that's who we are too, that we are dead to our sins. And then just as the Scripture says Jesus was raised from the grave, so too we are raised out of the grave away from our sin, away from the death that we were going to have to have in hell, deserving torment and punishment forever. We were raised out of it, resurrected, to walk in a new way of life, transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what baptism is, and that is why we do this. That's why we come here. And if you were here last week, you know... Who's coming down? We have Shane this morning. Shane, come on down, brother. Uh, and I wanted to give Shane an opportunity, in case you missed it last week, I wanted Shane to have the opportunity to share with you what God did in his heart last week. Um, all right, well, if you missed it last week, we'll hold my eyes out. Uh, <laughs> try not to do it today. Um, I don't really care anything, but uh, I just wanted to say that I always thought I was saved just because when I was younger, I was scared that I didn't want to go to hell, and I knew that God was the way out of that, but I didn't know the full story. I didn't know how it actually worked, and I remember praying to him, asking him not to let me go to hell, and uh it wasn't until last Sunday that that uh, God spoke to me, and it was clear as day that I never did it the right way. I never asked for repentance, and uh, I never received the Holy Spirit in my heart. But I did last week. Shalom. There will be no peace 
for our soul. And yet, the moment we repent and we give, as Shane did last week, we give our whole life to Christ, say, God, forgive me for my sins. I've sinned against you, but you have saved me. The moment that happens, we are baptized. The Holy Spirit comes to live and dwell in us. And we receive, at that very instant, the assurance that our God keeps His promises. Amen. So, brother, is it true that you have put your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? I'm going to ask you to come on up. <laughs> We're going to go all the way up the stairs. <laughs> By your profession of faith, it is my privilege, my brother, to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death. Raised to walk. Shame stands as a testimony to the power of the living God. Our God is still alive. Our God is still moving Amen. and working Amen. and transforming lives. Amen. And if there is one thing that I know for certain that God has been doing with these baptisms recently, He is calling on every single person in every single church, not just Conowingo, this is happening across the whole globe. Every single person must evaluate, do I have the peace and the absolute certainty that I didn't say the words because someone told me to say the words, but I know that I know that I know that the moment I die, I'm going to open my eyes and I'm going to see Jesus and He's going to say, I know you too. Amen. God has been saying it. He's been warning it. The Sunday school lesson this morning, the trumpet is going out. He is warning us to know that we know that we know where we stand with the God who created us. The time for doubt and the time for just hoping that we maybe we did, maybe we didn't. The time for doubt is over. Our God wants every single person to be saved. And as you sit in this pew, you know today, if you have had that moment, repent, confess, believe, and you were baptized by the Holy Spirit, you know it. And God knows it. And there is no escaping the truth. And that is what the testimony of the baptism is for every one of us this morning. Brother Rusty, if you could come up and give us our announcements of prayer. Please. Well, good morning. Good morning. It is still snowing, by the way. I can see it right up here. <laughs> but it is good to be here this morning. It'll be nice and warm. Um, just a few announcements. Um, our business meeting that was scheduled for today, or this evening, has been moved two weeks out. So put that on your calendar. It's February 18th, um, <clears throat> 6 p.m. And just like always, we'll have our fellowship afterwards. Um, and bring an appetizer, dessert, whatever you, you want to bring. Um, deacon meeting uh, Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, February 6th, uh, at 6 p.m. And then following that is church council um, at 7 p.m. And then trustees meeting is that following Tuesday, so the 13th at 7. And oh yeah, uh, the Valentine's Day banquet. If you were here for Sunday school, you're probably bothered by some small children. <laughs> And Alexis, am I? To sign up for the Valentine's Day banquet. Um, that is coming up next Sunday, uh, February the 11th at 6 p.m. Um, here at the church in the Fellowship Hall. Um, all of it is to benefit the youth group um, and just to, have, to come down and have a good time together and fellowship. Um, but we are doing some like really crazy awesome things with the youth and uh, we just need your support 
and uh, we need to raise some funds so that we can keep doing these really, really awesome things with youth, taking them out on retreats, um, going to conferences, um, and I can attest that the conference that we uh, we're going to in March literally changes lives. Um, I've seen it change the lives of the youth that we've taken there. Um, it has convicted and challenged me as I go, so you're not only supporting the youth, but you're also supporting the leadership that's, that's there. And uh, Jamie and Amy, wherever you guys are, um, thank you for all that you do and for taking us and putting up with all the crazy teenagers and crazy adults who think they're teenagers. Um, but yeah, at the end of service, there will be a sign-up sheet. Uh, there will be uh, teens at this entrance and that entrance. Uh, with the sign-up sheet, so if you didn't get to sign up uh, this morning or on our website, conwaygo.org, um, take the time, bother some of the youth that are going to be standing there and sign up and support our youth and come on out next Sunday night. Um, and then men's prayer breakfast, can't forget about that. Uh, that is the uh, third Sunday, February 18th at 9 a.m. So if you are a man of the male gender, Come on out, regardless of age, tiny to big. Um, we, we have really, really awesome breakfast, really good food, lots of bacon. Um, which reminds me of all the guys who, who cook. Thank you for all that you do. Um, right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, but also, uh, this brings to mind, um, please be in prayer for Mr. Jim, Mr. Jim Whitaker. Um, uh, I, I haven't heard an update on him. Uh, He's right there. He's here. Where's Mr. Jim? Mr. Jim! Praise God, you're here. You're alive. <laughs> I didn't even see you this morning. I apologize, Mr. Jim. Okay. But I, I want you to know that you are in our prayers, and uh, we are glad that you are here and with us, and that you will be cooking some more. <laughs> but uh, if you would uh, pray with me this morning as we continue to worship. Father, we just thank you so, so much for your grace, for your mercy that you have shown us, for your son and his blood that he shed for us. I pray as we take this time that we set aside just to worship you, that we would take our hearts and our minds and completely focus on you. If we could just take what's going on in our life and just put it away for now. And pray that you would fill our minds and our hearts and just be focused on you. We worship you in our prayers. We worship you in our songs. And Father, we worship you through the word that will come out to this congregation. I love you, Jesus, and it is in your holy name, Yeshua, that I pray. Amen. So I'll stay in this video offertory here.
Let us take time here to pray over these tithes and offerings that have been brought into your house, dear Lord. Lord, we want to give thanks again for these tithes and offerings that the Spirit has worked in each individual to bring what they can in those tithes and offerings. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be at work and that in this church, Lord, that the good stewardship of these monies go out into the community and show the love of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for your, your holy blood that is as a witness here in this church. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Amen. and small group discussions give participants encouragement, useful advice, and hope. The videos, and they're very believable. It just seemed like regular people speaking from the heart. They helped me focus my thoughts. Having many different people on the videos from week to week makes a huge difference. The video strengthened me. The way I grew up, people had a funeral. They went to somebody's house, ate a lot of food, and you never talked about it after that. Uh, and to be able to sit in a small group and hear people actually express what I was thinking and feeling was quite refreshing. I needed to be in a situation where I could talk freely about my feelings and my grief and not feel like that I was causing other people to be uncomfortable. My workbook helped me to unravel the feelings that were I was going through. I found that the workbook was so helpful in that while the video I was watching it, I could make notes. And it helps me go back and, and remember how God can help me. If you know people in your church or community who are grieving the death of a loved one, tell them about Grief Share. Or visit a Grief Share group yourself to heal from the pain of your grief. And remember, no matter how long ago you lost your loved one, you are always welcome at Grief Share. There was such a void until I got into Grief Share. Grief Share has been a big help and encouragement to me. Grief Share brought me out of my sadness. Begin your journey from mourning to joy at Grief Share.
and I did the baptism and, and all that. And I'm looking at the water, literally thinking, I'm so thirsty right now. <laughs> and uh, coming in here, so uh, so Jeff, thank you for this. Um, I was sitting here, I was, you know, I know my throat's getting getting dry just as I'm singing, and uh, he had no idea about any of that. Uh, but that's just how the Lord works, man. And, uh, and so I praise the Lord. Uh, for all those, and, and I say this with, uh, with a, a very true heart, a very warm heart, um, thank you to everybody in this church who prays for me and my family, who lifts me up um, and, and prays for the message, prays for, for all that God is doing here, but I know that you love me and, and you show me that love uh, through prayer and support in so many ways, so thank you so much. This message today is called, uh, it's a, continuing a series called His Story. And we're looking at Jesus and pictures of his ministry in the Old Testament. And uh, today we are going to be in the book of Isaiah. And the subtitle is A Rod from the Stem. A Rod from the Stem. Isaiah chapter 11, as you're turning to chapter 11 in your Bible, um, Isaiah is sometimes referred to as the fifth gospel. Uh, because everything you see Jesus doing uh, in the four main gospels, you see it spoken of in some way and defined in the uh, gospel, essentially, of Isaiah. And so, uh, so there are so many wonderful passages to look at. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 11, beginning here in verse 1, reading to verse 12. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord, or Yahweh, shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of Yahweh. His delight is in the fear of Yahweh, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your ministry of salvation. Thank you for your word that we can read and hear a chapter from a book written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And yet when we look at it, we can see clearly that you are the spirit of prophecy. You are the God who is sovereign. And if you say it, it happens. So, Lord, we ask for a blessing on this message today. We ask that this would be your message and none other. And, Father God, lastly, we pray for the one in here today who may not have a relationship with you yet. They may believe that there's a God or that there could be a God. They may hope that someday they would know you. But Father, let today be the day of their salvation as you open their eyes and heart 
through the power of your Holy Spirit, letting them see themselves, but most importantly, see you just as you are. Jesus is the God of salvation. And we pray in His great name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The first section that we're going to look at today is that the rod brings the Spirit. The rod brings the Spirit. We're going to begin here in verse 1. It says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And really, before we examine this passage here in Isaiah 11, we need to just look at the previous two verses just to get a context of what the Word of God is saying here in chapter 11. So Isaiah 10, verses 33 to 34, it says, Behold the Lord, and as a reminder, when you see the Lord in lowercase letters, that's Adonai. That's the idea of a master. So behold the master, and then it says the Lord in all capital letters, that's God's holy name, that's Yahweh. Then it says Yahweh of hosts, this is him as an an, an a general of the angelic armies, he will lop off the bow with terror, and those of high stature will be hewn down, and the haughty will be humbled. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. So, the contrast that's being set up in the book of Isaiah, what God is saying, is that there's going to be one human, very earthly kingdom that's exalting itself. And that's going to be contrasted with what we're going to find in Isaiah 11, and that is the one divine heavenly kingdom which is exalted by God. The Assyrian kingdom is the direct historical application, but the fulfillment is really any kingdom which establishes itself in opposition to God. Which, by the way, that doesn't mean necessarily that there is a king over a whole nation. This could very well be, by the way, your own and my own personal heart within our body that can be set up and established in opposition to God. So God says He will lop off the bow and cut or hewn down the humble. He will humble it and make it fall. God is going to do it all by Himself. He says this will be done by the Mighty One. The Mighty One is our God. Even though this empire or kingdom views itself as this great forest with iron. And the contrast from chapter 10 to chapter 11 could not be any more clear. While the human empire sees itself as this dense forest protected by its physical size and strength, the divine empire, look how it starts, chapter 11, this lowly, cut down stump. A rod from the stem or the stump of Jesse. A disciplinary rod was going to rise up from the seemingly defeated and conquered people of Israel. Jesse is the father of David and so many others in Israel. God continues that a branch was going to sprout from the root of Jesse. In other words, what appeared to be a lifeless plant was going to grow large and one day it was going to bear fruit. What looked dead was going to be, hear this, born again. Indeed, when Jesus was born, he was born into a Jewish nation that was under the oppressive rule of the Romans. Israel and the whole Jewish nation was bordering on insignificance in regard to military or political power. But Jesus is the rod that was going to come up and smash the nations. Jesus is the branch that was going to sprout with eternal life. Revelation 19.15 says it this way, Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That is Jesus. So verse 2, it says, The Spirit of Yahweh shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Yahweh. 
We find in this verse that the rod and the branch which spring up will be a person. It says that this spirit will rest upon him. This person has not one spirit, but this person has seven spirits. These seven spirits begin with none other than the spirit of Yahweh God himself. That one spirit then goes up and branches off into three pairs of branches. Not unlike something we read about in the book of Exodus, chapter 25, verse 31 to 32. You shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. And the lampstand will be of hammered work, and its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs and flowers shall be of one piece. And six branches shall come out of its sides. Three branches of the lampstand out of one side, three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. Is there a connection between the lampstand of the tabernacle and the seven spirits of God? Revelation 4-5. From the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. And look at this. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are what? The seven spirits of God. And who do these seven spirits of God identify themselves with personally? Revelation 5, 6. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are what the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Concerning these seven spirits, we find them organized in Isaiah 11 as such. Branch one is the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Wisdom is discerning the unseen truths of our reality. Wisdom is discerning the unseen truths of our reality. It's seeing things the way God sees them invisibly. Understanding is discerning the commands of God. So when we see these words, wisdom is just seeing the unseen kingdom of God. But when we read about this understanding, that's always used in connection with the commandments of God. When we hear the commandments, this is the kind of spirit and, and, and understanding that says, I understand what God is saying, and I understand why He's saying it. Branch two is the spirit of counsel and might. Counsel is that ability for you and I to discern the advice that we get. Specifically in relation to God's plans. Has anybody ever given you counsel? Anybody ever given you advice? We ought to, as the family of God, be able to distinguish between earthly counsel and godly counsel. The might that it speaks of is discerning the strength that's going to be necessary to carry out God's plans. So we receive the wisdom and understanding and advice comes and then it takes a spirit of might, a spirit of strength to say, I'm going to do this and this is what it's going to take. This is when that difficult thing comes in our life and we say, God, I can't do it. And God says, you're right, you can't. But our God can. Amen. The third branch is the spirit of knowledge and the fear of Yahweh. Coming together, these two are in perfect unity. Knowledge is discerning the ability of God's potential. That is knowledge. And Proverbs tells us that wisdom or knowledge begins with the fear of the Lord, the fear of Yahweh. So we cannot possibly understand God's potential until we have a reverent fear of our God. That fear of Yahweh is discerning the reverence of God's truth and word. It's the fear that our God deserves. Not fear in that we are afraid, but fear in that we are reverent. We understand who this God is. Together they form this one perfect spirit of wisdom and truth which only belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah was inspired by God to prophesy that one day Israel would appear to be completely defeated and permanently cut down, but in fact God would rise up an ancestor of Jesse who would be none other than God Himself with the seven spirits in Him. Verse 3, His delight is in the fear of Yahweh. He shall not judge by the sight of His eyes, nor decide by the hearing of His ears. The one who is to come was going to delight 
in the fear of Yahweh. This means that Jesus literally lives to bring reverence to Yahweh God Himself. What can we do with this application as we look at this idea of Jesus' testimony? We can take it and we can say, so if, if Jesus just lived to glorify God in reverence, then we can look at the four Gospels and you and I can realize for certain that we are reading a living, breathing example of the pure reverence of truth in Christ. To put it simply, Jesus' life is the perfection of worship. When you see the way Jesus lived, that's how we worship our God with our life. Such a life could only have been lived by God Himself. That's why He did it for us. So let us consider the characteristic of such fear. First, it says, He shall not judge by the sight of His eyes. How often has the Word of God turned us into recognizing that we are foolish if we live with the mentality that I've got to see it to believe it. So often the Word of God takes us and reminds us it is foolish to think that we live our life as I've got to see it to believe it. Even if we think that's how we live, that is not how we live. Jesus does not judge us by the sight of His eyes because what is visible is never telling the whole story. Perhaps there is still someone sitting here today, and you are a see-it-to-believe-it type person. Ask yourself this simple question, and don't lie. Just don't. Ask yourself, but don't lie about the answer. Have you, if you're a see-it-to-believe-it person, have you ever seen motive? Have you ever seen with your eyes anyone's motivation? Say you see somebody and they're giving a $5 bill to a homeless person. All that we're able to see, bless you, is a person giving a $5 bill. We have no idea what the motivation for that person is. And in fact, even if we ask them, hey, what was your motivation? And they say, oh, I just like to help people who are in need. We don't know, first of all, if they're telling the truth. Hopefully they are. But even if they say that, guess what we still have not seen? Motive. We still didn't see it. It is absolutely real. We still didn't see it. It happened in their heart. So then God is not so foolish as to judge anything based on what he sees with his eyes. More specifically, he's not so foolish as to judge you and I by what we want to present publicly. Instead, Jesus judges the heart. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, very famous verse. But Yahweh said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For Yahweh does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but Yahweh looks at the heart. <coughs> Yahweh looks at the heart, and because Jesus is the one true God, He looks at the heart. The second thing we see is He doesn't decide by the hearing of His ears. He does not make decisions based solely on what people say. Now this is critical in light of Shane's testimony, not just last week, but this morning as well. Shane had said what you and I would say, these are the right words that you say. These are the, this is the sinner's prayer. You just say the sinner's prayer and you're saved. No. Because Shane had not surrendered to the full authority of the Scriptures in Jesus Christ, his life and his soul were in severe jeopardy. Jesus warns us that many Many people will think they're saved based on their own words and their own works and actions and He's going to turn to them and He's going to decide based on what's actually happened or not happened in their heart. Mark 7 verse 6 He answered and said to them Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written This people honors me with their lips but their heart is far from me. What does this mean? It means that people are going to think they're saved because of what they have said. 
But if they're honest with themselves, they will know for sure the Holy Spirit does not live inside of them. They never gave their soul over to Jesus for Him to be the master of every aspect of their life. So if Jesus doesn't judge based on what He sees or what He, he hears, then what is the basis of the judgment of the heart? Verse 4. With righteousness He shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of His mouth and with the breath of His lips He shall slay the wicked. He will use righteousness. This is the idea of being right with God. How in the world can you and I as a sinner, which we all are, you and I are all sinners, how do you and I become right with God? How could, judge, how could God ever judge us as being right with Him if all we do and say is lies and sin? Romans 10, 8 through 11. What does it say? What does the Bible say? What does the Scripture say? The Word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the Word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Now this is critical right here. With the heart one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. The Scripture says, whoever believes on Him will not be put to shame. It is not the mouth that results in righteousness. It's not what we do. It's do we believe that Jesus is who He says He is? And do we believe it in our heart? And the moment we believe that Jesus died for us and took our sins, resurrected from the grave, the moment that we believe that, all our mouth can do is confess what we've already believed. Oh, I, I'm saved. I've been bought by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Jesus judges everyone the same. That's the beauty of it. Have they believed in His death, burial, and resurrection? And so believing, have they said so publicly with their mouth that Jesus is their Lord and Savior? That's the sole basis of the judgment of God. And this is why it doesn't matter how hard we try to do good things. It will never be as good as dying for the sins of every human ever created. Amen. Nor will it be as good as resurrecting from the grave and defeating and conquering sin and death. Nothing you and I will ever do will be that good. <coughs> and honestly, if you were the judge of all creation... Which life would you use as the standard of perfection? Would you use your own life? Or would you use the perfect life of Jesus Christ? Jesus is looking for the poor in spirit. He's looking for the meek of the earth. Matthew 5, 3-6. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of God. What's poor in spirit? It's recognizing, you know what? I've lived my life long enough, I've known myself long enough to realize that I'm pretty much bankrupt when it comes to morality. Even when I try my hardest, I seem to fall the worst. That's when you're poor in spirit. You're recognizing, I, I don't think I'm going to save myself. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We'll look at that a little bit later. Blessed are the meek, the humble. They shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. You know, for all those who choose to reject what Jesus has done, He says He's going to strike the earth with the rod of His mouth. He's going to slay the wicked with the breath of His lips. If you notice in that verse in Isaiah, Jesus doesn't even touch anyone with His hand. In order for His judgment to pass, it says He uses His mouth, and he uses the breadth of his lips. Compare this also with what he says about the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7-8. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will look at this consume with what? The breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Just the words of Jesus Christ and the image of 
of the invisible God, the bright illumination of the glory of God, is going to knock over anyone who stands in his way. So understand clearly, we have these movies that come out and all this idea of apocalypse and the absolute wrong use of that word anyway. But it's, it, it sets the stage. Oh, Jesus is going to come in. He's going to duke it out with the devil. There's going to be no duking out. That's right. <laughs> Jesus is going to be something like this. All we know in Scripture is it's going to be something like this. <gasps> He's going to breathe. Can you imagine that power? Amen. Can you imagine that power? Some of you in here, you've been in fights. You've punched people in the face. And you know what that's like. Can you imagine somebody coming up to you and you're like, are you ready? And they're like, yeah. <sighs> and you just fly back. Would you even get up? Just the breath of Jesus Christ. Just the words coming out of his being is going to set everything right. He's going to slay the wicked and the proud by the power of these seven flaming spirits dwelling inside of himself as he speaks the word of the living God. Concluding point number one, the rod brings the spirit. Jesus judges with a holy spirit. Jesus judges with a holy spirit. It's going to be completely righteous. When we receive the judgment on our soul, we're going to look back at God and say, that was, that was right, that was good. Section number two, the rod brings peace. The rod brings peace. Verse five says, Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. These passages teach us about our Messiah. Not only are his actions done from the spirit of Yahweh himself, but even his external appearance is a reflection of his character and his nature. He's got a belt on his loins. He's got a belt on his waist. And it's righteousness and faithfulness. Together they reflect what one commentator calls spiritual integrity and spiritual loyalty. I like that description. Clothing in Scripture is often used to define character. If you look at Psalm 132, we're going to look at a few verses in Psalm 132. Look at how God uses clothing to describe character. Verse 9, he says, Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your saints shout for joy. Verse 16, I will clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. God writes about himself in verse 17, There I will make the horn of David grow, that's Jesus, I will prepare a lamp for my anointed Anointed is the same word as Messiah. The imagery here of God clothing and surrounding Himself with the seven spirits of God. And then verse 18, He goes further. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon Himself, that's the Messiah, His crown shall flourish. Jesus, because of who He is internally, He's clothed with this crown, glory. But for everyone who rejects Him, it says He's going to clothe them with shame. So what's the result of the judgment of Christ? Verse 6, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Josiah thinks that word fatling is funny. <laughs> I've said it twice this morning. He tries to whisper, but he forgets he's right in front of me. He's like, he said fatling. <laughs> he said it in church. <laughs> See, when we go to the scriptures and we hear about our God, um, some of us have a hard heart. It's just the truth. Some of us have a hard heart. We look at God and we say, God is so mean. He, like, he's so judgmental. And he's just like, he just wants to take humans and throw them into hell and, and make them burn. And like, golly, I didn't come here for that. We deserve that. I've been to court a few times. I know I've talked about it some. One of the scariest things in the world is standing before a judge and saying, I'm guilty. And knowing it's true. It's one of the hardest things to do. Just to admit, 
the truth of where I actually stand. It's hard. I'm guilty. Why do I bring this up? Because many of us may have a hard heart toward God saying, God is so judgmental. He's just, man, that's mean. He's going to. We deserve that. But our God is so loving and kind and gracious that He came to die so we don't have to. Amen. You want to see the character of God, the nature of God? Look at this verse and see what His intentions are. The predator is going to dwell alongside the prey. And it's going to be safe for them to do so. There is an application here about animals, but more importantly, we find a principle of unity in the full restoration of this creation that God made. Notice, too, that every living creature, as they're unified and they're sitting and dwelling in peace, notice who they're being led by. A little child. Genesis 1, 27-28, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion, He says, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We were created to have dominion over everything on this earth. That was the intention. One of the most difficult realities that God desires for us to understand is that sin, as I said, it's our own fault. Another difficult reality that God desires for us to understand is that sin will not last forever, no matter how much we think we love it or hate it. Instead, God is going to rid the universe of sin, and He's going to restore things back to their original design. All things living in harmony under the stewardship of by the grace of God of humanity. Before we get to this next passage, think about what God has actually written down through the prophet Isaiah. That the growth of this little stem from the stump of Jesse is going to be so perfectly holy and righteous that it's going to change the way the whole world operates. God's love through His Son Jesus is so powerful that He can and He does transform life. Verse 7, the cow and the bear shall graze, and their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Three more principles of Jesus' righteous judgment. He's going to judge the earth, and sin is going to be rid of. But this is what's going to be left over. The cow and the bear are grazing together. There's going to be no more competition, no more food chain. The calf and the cub are lying together. These are the babies. There's going to be safe rest at every single level of existence. The lion is going to be eating straw like an ox. No more death and no more loss of this lifeblood inside every living creature. I've read things that say, you know, clearly the Bible must have been written by a bunch of people who don't know science because a lion can't live on these kinds of yeah. menus. Now, I'm no super genius, but if God can take nothing and then speak a lion into existence, I'm pretty sure he can work the diet out. <laughs> God is telling us that he's, Jesus is coming to bring restoration back to that original design, Genesis 1.30. Look at what the Bible says. When it was perfect, look at how it was. Every beast of the earth, every bird of the air, everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given what? What's the diet? Every green herb for food. This is exactly how God made it in Eden. Every animal was just eating plants. There was no spilling of blood. And it was so. The completed ministry of Jesus is going to result in the world becoming <coughs> void of fear or death. Verse 8, the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. The weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. Children of all ages will be able to play and explore without worrying about poisonous strikes from the serpent. 
You know, there are some churches who have taken this verse out of context, these types of verses out of context, and they try to handle snakes, and they get bit, and they die because of foolishness. But Revelation 20.10 says this, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. It says that children are going to be able to go wherever they need to go and they're not going to get bit by the serpent. And somebody here may think, well, I know that this church doesn't believe in an actual devil and an actual hell. Yes, we do, because the actual God made them. Amen. They are real. The problem is, is that our view of Satan has a lot more to do with Hollywood than it does with the Holy Word. The devil strikes and devours people, not with pitchforks, not with a tail. He does it with lies and deceit. The poison of the serpent is his mouth. Imagine for a moment how intelligent you could be if you could live just 150 years. Now, what if you can live to be a thousand years old? How much would you know? Think about how good we were at lying when we were seven or eight years old. Now, imagine thousands of years. The Bible says that that's his native tongue. The devil's native tongue is lies. He just loves to lie. Now, imagine thousands of years of watching human beings like you and me live our life. And being able to come up and just craft just the right kind of lie that we need to hear. First and foremost, that the devil's not real to begin with. But second, that we really don't need a Savior. You can live your life however you want, consequence free. And you're never going to be accountable to any God. That's the lie. That's the lie he's telling One of the most overlooked truths is that Satan probably believes in God more than most atheists would profess to. The cobra's bite is his ability to deceive us, which is why Jesus comes to bring eternal security from any more poison. Do you want to be a child that can no longer get bit and deceived. You're going to have to have the antivenom, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. Concluding point number two, the rod brings peace. Jesus reigns with a righteous peace. That's what he's coming to bring. That's what, that's what the finality of all existence is going to look like. A righteous peace. That's our God. Final section today, the rod brings recovery. The rod brings recovery. Verse 9, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all thy holy mountain for the sea, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. No more hurt, no more destruction. There'll no longer be an existence or reality where pain or decay are even possible. Hallelujah. Where exactly does God specify this is going to occur? He says, in all of his holy mountain. Zechariah 8 3. Thus says Yahweh, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of Yahweh of hosts, the holy mountain. God's holy mountain is Zion. That is Jerusalem. It is that special city where God has personally set apart to be His dwelling place here on earth. So the very location where you and I as humanity, we've designated it for war for centuries, our God is declaring it to be eternally hurt in destruction-free zone. Filled with the truth of His holy presence instead. How's God going to do it? He says He's going to fill the earth with the knowledge of Himself. We have a strategic clue when it comes to the Gospel. If we want there to be peace somewhere, we have to talk about Jesus. We have to introduce the knowledge of Yahweh God. By contrast, when there is ignorance or where you and I neglect 
the clear teaching from God to go and make disciples, this is what it looks like. Jeremiah 18, 15 to 17. He says, Because my people have forgotten me, they burned incense to worthless idols. That's worshiping false gods. And they caused themselves to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths to walk in pathways and not on a highway, to make their land desolate and a perpetual hissing, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and shake his head. I will scatter them as with an east wind before the enemy. I will show them the back and not the face in the day of their calamity. Forgetting the knowledge of Yahweh is inviting calamity and, and destruction into our homes and into our nation. If we really want to see change in schools, if we really want to see change in the workplace, if we really want to see change in rural farms, in Dollar General, in Martins, in Walmart, then we need to introduce the Lord Jesus Christ there. You say, I don't hear anybody talk about Jesus. What would your friend say? What would your coworker say? If they can say the same thing, guess what that means? We're not saying it either. You ever just walked in a public place, seen somebody you don't know? Do you know about Jesus Christ? You say, I would never do that. That's for, that's for you, preacher. That's for you to do. God says, my people for God. If we have the Holy Spirit in us, we are His people. Forgetting the knowledge of Yahweh is inviting calamity and, and destruction into our homes and nation. Praise God that when He brings the fullness of His knowledge across the globe, it's going to heal the land permanently. Verse 10, In that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people, and for the Gentiles who seek Him, and His resting place shall be glorious. A lot in this verse, we'll go through it. Jesus has been described as a rod, a stem, a branch, and now a root. What can we make of this? He is the tree of life. Notice, too, that even in this verse, described as a root, he's still standing as a banner. We talked about this battle standard last week. It's that one that's used in war to display the colors and the insignia of the military force that it represents. What military force does Jesus bring into combat? Song of Solomon 2.4, he brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was what? Love. Love. And again, Song of Solomon 6.4. Oh my love, you're as beautiful as Terzah, lovely as Jerusalem. And she says, awesome, the bride says of her groom. Awesome as an army with banners. Why does God say that this root stands as a banner? Because Jesus fought a war for us and he already won. There he stands victorious over the entire earth declaring it is finished. Consider this. When people were mocking Jesus when he was on the cross, they're saying, if you're so powerful, why don't you take yourself down from the cross? You know, from Jesus' eternal perspective, he was already standing as a banner over that same holy mountain. <coughs> By the way, a holy mountain, he spoke himself into existence. We find this root of Jesse, the source of everything Jewish or Hebrew, that's Jesse, it's also destined to be sought out by the Gentiles, everything that's really not Jewish or Hebrew. So why is the Jewish Messiah sought out by the people who are not Jewish? Because God designated the Hebrews to be His chosen people. And from His chosen people, there's going to be one Messiah for the whole earth. And this is why when John saw Jesus coming, he declared in John 1.29, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the Jews, is that what it says? The sin of the world. This final phrase in verse 10 says, His resting place shall be glorious. The Messiah is going to rest, and where He rests, it will be glorious. Two distinct ways we can see this. First of all, when Jesus went to the grave, the grave could hold. Even the grave where Jesus rested became glorious because it was empty. But second, Jesus ascended into heaven is right now his resting place is the right hand of the Father, most glorious in all creation. Acts 7, 55-56 is what Stephen saw. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven.
heaven. And he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. This is the reality of who Jesus is, where Jesus rests, and how Jesus appears right now. If we could see it, that's what we would see. But Jesus will come again. Verse 11 tells us, It shall come to pass in that day. What day? The day of the Lord. That the Lord shall set His hand again the second time to recover the remnant of His people who are left. It shall come to pass means this is certain because God cannot lie. It shall come to pass in the day of the Lord spoken of throughout all of Scripture, specifying the way in which Yahweh God is going to judge the earth. And in that day, what's going to happen? He says, the Lord shall set His hand again the second time. And He's going to do it to recover a people who've been left. If He sends His hand a second time, what does that mean? It means He must have sent it a first time. Jesus' first coming was His ministry of a perfect life in the law, a perfect death on the cross, perfect salvation through His perfect resurrection. The concept of Messiah coming twice seems to have baffled many Jewish scholars. When they look at Jesus, they say He can't be the Messiah because the wolf isn't dwelling with the lamb. The lion isn't eating straw like an ox. He must not be the Messiah because I don't see it. But isn't it ironic that the very passage where it says this is what the Messiah is going to do, it tells us He doesn't do it on the first coming. He says, look, when is that day going to come when the lion is eating and it, straw and, and when you see this, the wolf lion, when are you going to see this? He says, well, this is the day when he comes the second time. That's when it's going to happen. God says he's coming to recover a remnant. Let us recall exactly what Jesus says when he was the right hand of God coming the first time. Matthew 24, 30. Then, at the end, second coming, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Jesus told everyone He was going to come again, just as the prophets had written that He would. And when the right hand of God comes that second time, He's going to reap a harvest of faithful saints. Jesus even gives us the parable of what that process is going to look like. Matthew 13, 30. He says, yeah, let them both grow together. He's speaking about the parable. Grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather the tares, the weeds, bind them in bundles, and then burn them. But gather the wheat and put them into the barn. Jesus tells us exactly what this is going to look like. Angels are going to come out, and there's going to be the weeds. These are going to be the ones who are lost rejecting Jesus in their heart. He says, okay, they're going to be gathered up and burned, thrown to hell. He's like, then there's others who are saved. They put their faith in Christ. He says, the angels are going to gather them up. They're going to go with Jesus. They're going to be in the barn. They're going to be in the storehouse. We're going to spend eternity with, with God in heaven. The new Jerusalem. Verse 12, it says, He will set a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. This verse reiterates what we just read in the previous verse. People from all over. It even says in verse 11 that even if you're on an island, it's not going to matter. God's going to find you. He's going to get you. There will be no escaping His wrath and judgment, but more importantly, every follower of Jesus is not going to be forgotten about. The same language is used here. He displays His banner over all the nations. The banner of love, mind you. He will assemble and gather all those who were outcasts and dispersed among his children. No matter how far a person may have traveled in their heart, his banner of love has already won the war. It extends to the four corners of the world and it declares salvation and forgiveness for all men and all women who put their faith in Jesus. This whole message today foretells of an event where Jesus returns in all His glory and splendor to judge the world for its sin and rejection of our God. 
But most importantly, He's coming to collect a remnant who would choose to believe. It started with what seemed like a stump that was as good as dead. Just like when Jesus was on the cross. Just like when Jesus was buried, it looked like it was all over. But it finishes with the resurrection of that same stump who turns out to be the tree of life offered to all of mankind. Jesus is the branch prophesied by Isaiah who is the hand of God given for you and for me. Will you be a remnant for Him to come back and recover or will you be a rejecter for Him to remove and destroy? The choice is yours. And the choice is free. You're free to make whatever choice you believe God is leading you to today. The rod is coming again. Amen. Concluding point number two. The rod brings recovery. Jesus returns to recover a remnant. Jesus comes to recover a remnant. We're going to have an invitation. What that means is we're going to stand and we're going to pray. And after we pray together, we're going to have an opportunity to respond to whatever it is that God has spoken to you today. Maybe you saw the witness and testimony of shame. You say, you know what? I'm pretty sure that's me. I said some words when I was a kid. It really didn't mean anything. It didn't change my life. And I'm pretty sure I'm lost. You may be sitting here and you say, you know what? I, I, I'm saved. I know I'm saved, but I've never been baptized. I've never been obedient to do what God told me to do. Maybe you're sitting in here and you've been saved, you've been baptized, and God has said, this is the church, the local church He wants you to join and become a member of and be committed to the gospel kingdom work that He's doing here. Whatever it is that the Lord is telling you to do, this invitation is God's invitation to you to say, I want you to come forward and you can respond obediently to the call of the Lord. I'm going to ask everybody to please stand up and we're going to have a moment of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for this prophet Isaiah. Had he not been faithful to write down what You told him to write down, we could never have read it this morning and glorified Your name. All we see here is Jesus Christ coming up to save His people. Thank You, Lord. Thank You for extending that offer of salvation to everyone here today. Thank You for one or two that You may be speaking directly to right now. And they feel this uncomfortable burden to move and they don't know why. Speak to them in their spirit, God, the one thing that's real in this world. Let them know that you're here. You forgive them. And that it is time for them to respond. We pray that you would do your work during this time, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Uh, praise the Lord for you being here today. I thank you for, uh, for coming to worship with us, to praise the name of Jesus Christ for who He is. Uh, I also pray that if you have not read the book of Isaiah, and I don't mean just read, just get to the end, but study. If you've not studied the book of Isaiah, they, they call it the fifth gospel for a reason. The book is incredible. Um, wonderful insight of who our Lord and Savior is, His ministry and His character. And so let's join hands today as we conclude this service. <coughs> Head out from this place. <laughs> Oh, yeah.